Uh, how are you all today? Good. Good. Did you have a good sleep? That was my next question. Did you sleep well? <laughs> I had a horrible sleep last night. And usually I sleep very, very well, and I've taught myself to fall asleep instantly when I hit the pill. I'm very proud of that. I kept waking up every two hours and going, don't be late for UBC. <laughs> How embarrassing would it be to be late to my talk about sleep by sleeping in? So uh, I'm here to talk to you this morning about sleeping and uh, behavioral approaches to sleeping, obviously. Here's our agenda. Uh, we'll do the first four items fairly quickly. I'll talk to you about uh, what are some of the common um, problems, how common are the sleep problems, what problems does this pose for the kids and their families, the different types of sleep problems, and I'll go from you know, operant behavioral sleep problems through medical, although we're not going to deal with the medical piece, just so that you understand the full um, scope of the problem. Um, assessment of sleep problems, a little bit of medical assessment, and then more of what we do in terms of assessment as behavior analysts, and then the meat of it is behavior analytic solutions to, to sleep problems. So here's my background when it comes to sleep. When I was a master's student, I did a practicum, SIPC 597. And the practicum course required you to do, pick a topic and do a comprehensive literature search, design an intervention based on that search, and then deliver it to a client and produce measurable outcomes and take the data. So I picked the topic of behavioral interventions for pediatric sleep disturbance. So I did a very, very thorough and comprehensive lit review on sleep problems and, and the behavioral solutions to those problems. Put a lot of work into that. Uh, came up with a whole bunch of um, strategies to remediate these problems. Then I met with a client, Emily's parents, about solving Emily's sleep problems. And I had kind of a, a buffet of options available to them. And I sat down with them to, so they, they could pick from that buffet the thing that's going to work best for them. It's not something where you can go in and dictate to the family what they need to do at bedtime. And then I spent a few weeks uh, at night at Emily's house, helping them implement the intervention. And that was a tremendous learning experience. I'll come back to the lit review in a second. but. In terms of the, the intervention itself, and I'll talk about this strategy in a few moments, but we did a faded bedtime. So here was Emily's problem. She was four or five years old, about to go off to kindergarten. She was a tall five-year-old and a very, very strong five-year-old, like an Olympic wrestler type strong five-year-old. And what would happen is uh, her little brother would go to bed at eight or nine, and then she would uh, lie between mom and dad on the sofa and wait for the 11 o'clock news to come on. Right, something about Peter Mansbridge voice, I think. And she would then fall asleep on the couch in the dim living room with the news playing. And at the end of the news, dad would pick her up and take her upstairs to her own bedroom, put her in bed. And then mom and dad would go to their bed and they get a couple hours of sleep alone in their own bed before pitter patter, Emily comes tearing into the room, jumps in between them and sleeps the rest of the night there and probably sleeping like an H shape so that she's headbutting mom and kicking dad in the kidneys. And she's strong, so this is miserable, right? They don't want this to continue happening as she's getting bigger and bigger. And they've tried a few different things, right? Dad's main strategy was if he heard her coming, he would run up and stand in the doorway, and Emily, Emily would be tearing down the hall and see Dad, and then turn around and go back to her bed, right? And that worked, kind of, except she'd just basically wait in her bed until she heard Dad snoring, and then she'd try again. And after a few attempts, she would win, right? So this was entrenched. So the behavioral intervention for Emily was we did a faded bedtime. I can't remember the exact details uh, on the clock, so I'll kind of uh, make that up as I go. But if her baseline data, um, if we determined that she would tend to fall asleep naturally by midnight, then the procedure is basically we were going to keep her up past midnight until she was dead on her feet. And then we would put her to bed and try and increase the, the establishing operation for sleep. She's literally so tired that she's quite likely, when you lie her down, to just zonk right out. So we set this up, and I went there the first night, and she goes through her regular bedtime. She brushed her teeth, put on her pajamas, had a story, and then she sits in the living room uh, with just dad and I. Mom and, and little brother went to bed, and we waited till midnight or 12.30, and then dad put her to bed. So no more couch, no more news. He takes her up to the room, puts her down, kisses her goodnight, goes out into the hall, and now the procedure is she should be so tired because we've kept her up so late. And she was so bored downstairs. There was no food, no entertainment, no TV. She was just literally sitting there in the darkened room waiting until we finally let her go to bed. She lies down. Dad comes down. We're sitting on the stairs together with a flashlight and a clipboard and a stopwatch. And the protocol is we've got 15 minutes. If she isn't asleep in 15 minutes, we, we take her out of her bed because we're teaching this really powerful, tight stimulus control. When you lie down, you fall asleep really, really fast, right? And we should be able to expect that. So she got up and she came downstairs and busted. Dad and I are sitting there with our flashlights. And so we take her back downstairs and we sit there for another half hour or an hour. And then we take her back up. And this is hard work, right? Because you have to keep her awake without entertaining her so that she wants to be awake. And we take her back up and she gets up again and we go back downstairs. So the first night I was there till about 3 o'clock in the morning. 
And then I had to go home and dad went to sleep and I had to get up for work and uh, Emily had to get up because we keep the bed, the wake up time the same. You don't get to sleep in now that you went to bed at three o'clock. So the following night she should be even more tired when we put her to bed later. And I was there for about two weeks and three o'clock was the latest on the first night. And then every night I could go home a little bit earlier because she would go to bed and fall asleep. And they eventually got her bedtime all the way back to dad could take her and put her in her own bed in her own room at 9.30 and she'd fall asleep. And they were very, very happy with the outcome. So that was a, a successful outcome. Now remember I did this great big uh, lit review. <clears throat> After I was finished all that work, somebody gave me this book. I know many of you know it, Mark Duran's Sleep Better. Literally, without any exaggeration, everything I picked up in the lit review is packaged beautifully in this for clinicians and for parents. And which basically taught me you don't need to do the lit review, just go get Mark Duran's book, right? <laughs> um, Pat Fryman, who you know is a past president of ABA International, he also has a popular book with some clever title like, Good night, I love you, sweet dreams. Now be quiet and go to sleep. I think that's the title of his book. So there's another competing book. Literally, if you are going to be working on sleep, this is the, the resource you need on your shelf. You don't need to bother going through the lit review because all the strategies and the data sheets, etc., they're all in here. So I, I want to give a big plug to this book. Mark Durand was here a couple of years ago to ABBA, and of course I got him to, to sign my book. So this is even you know, doubly special for me. Uh, the other uh, thing that I want to cite in terms of resources for this talk is... Uh, the sleep sig at IMFAR. How many of you are familiar with IMFAR? A few. There's the International Society for Autism Research, a lot of medical folks looking at autism, and they have their annual conference, IMFAR, the International Meeting for Autism Research. And Dr. Mallow is a neurologist by training, <clears throat> and I believe she has a child or two of her own <clears throat> with autism. And she's a researcher at Vanderbilt University, and she um, basically initiated the development of the sleep SIG at IMFAR. So you can Google IMFAR. It's expensive to be a member, but you can be a member of the SIG at no cost and lurk on their email listserv and see what's happening out there in the broader field of sleep intervention, um, in the medical piece in particular. And I'll, I'll bring in a bit of information that I've gotten from Dr. Uh, Mallow as well. Bit of a sidebar just to put how important this is in context. You guys have figured out, I've figured out through our clinical experience that these three things are of critical importance when we're working with families, right? We can't ignore these things. We don't want to work with a family for years and years and years and their kid still has major sleep problems or still isn't eating or, God forbid, isn't toilet trained, right? You've probably all had that experience where you go in if you're in an early intervention and you go in to work with the, the child and the therapist and you arrive at the house and you go downstairs, you go into the therapy, therapy room and we do our thing and we come up at the end and mom says, how was the session? And we say, it was good. Mom says, that's great. And you go home realizing she has no idea really what we did for two hours, right? And that's not to belittle what we're doing. What we're doing down there is really, really important, right? We're building all these composite skills towards a bigger compo component skills towards a bigger composite, which is a, hopefully a really strong outcome, right? There's a cumulative effect of what we're doing in therapy. But the parents don't see a, an immediate tangible thing, right? They don't really know what was happening in, in therapy. But if you go in and you solve any of these problems, then immediately, right, this is the walk on water trifecta. They're worshiping you. Thank you. This was a big deal. You know, I appreciate what you're doing with our kid in therapy, but wow, now that he's eating, we can go to restaurants. Wow, now that he's out of diapers, we're saving so much money and we don't have to, you know, be bothered by all the hassle of changing poopy diapers and things like that. And of course, if they're sleeping, everybody's sleeping. Because if the kid's not sleeping, the family's not sleeping. So if you can fix this, you know, it's good press for us. It's pat ourselves on the back. We should have a behavior analyst cl uh, clinic beside every pediatrician's office. So any parent can come to us for any of these things and more. Right? So I just, that's a bit of a sidebar, just to put that in, uh, the importance of it in context. So what's the problem when it comes to sleep? Statistically, about a third of all kids have sleep problems. Any of you have sleep problems when you were a kid? Did you talk in your sleep or go sleep walking or have a hard time going to bed or want to sleep with mom and dad, right? Some of you who have kids right now, you probably see some of those things. So first of all, it's not uncommon in the normal population. When you look at the prevalence in autism, you get one of these fabulously broad uh, ranges, so broad that really what's the use of it? See? But split the middle, say 65%. That still means the majority of kids that we work with are gonna have sleep problems. So as behavioral clinicians, we should have a, a repertoire of skills to deal with this. Statistically, most of our clients will need it, right? So it's really, really important. This is one of the things that I learned from Dr. Mallow, the neurologist, is that sleep requires a normal ner central nervous system. Right? Sleep is a very complex neurological function. Uh, infants spend a lot of time sleeping because their brains are building themselves. Right? You've got dendritic pro proliferation, you've got dendritic pruning, and you've got all this neural stuff going on. Sleep's really important. Sleep's really important for teenagers' brains. Sleep's very important for our brains, right? so that we don't get run down and that we're coherent the next day. 
And it requires a normal nervous system to have a normal night's sleep. And put that in context of the kids we work with, they don't have normal central nervous systems, right? So then we shouldn't be surprised with that uh, previous statistic that most of them will have problems because they have abnormal nervous systems, right? Again, we should expect that we're going to need to deal with these problems. Having sleep problems obviously predisposes you to all sorts of other issues. Think of yourselves, right? This isn't autism specific. This applies to you and I. If you're not sleeping, you're in a bad mood, right? Whatever term you want to use, setting event, you know, establishing operation, this predis predispose predisposes you to behavioral problems. Right? You're more likely to act out. You're more likely to have road rage if you're tired, to get in a fight with your spouse or with your kids if you're tired. And the same, is for our, same goes for our clients. Cognitive impairments, right? ICBC will tell you driving fatigued is the same as driving drunk. You're not fully there, right? You're not fully competent behind the wheel. It shouldn't be operating a motor vehicle. And if you're not sleeping, if our kids aren't sleeping, this is a nasty cycle where they're not feeling as well during the day and then they don't get a good sleep and that affects the next day and you're just stuck in this miserable cycle and this miserable cycle, of course, is impacting the parents as well, right? They're not happy either. And then there's specific research when it comes to autism that problems with sleep, and this is fairly well established in the literature, um, sleep problems exacerbate the core symptoms of autism when it comes to social and communication, right? It has a negative impact. In terms of problem behavior, you know, Matson et al. In, uh, this year looked at uh, sleep problems and problem behavior and they found that even mild sleep problems leads to the presence of problem behavior, right? So that's not a shock, is it? That's not a surprise. If our kids aren't sleeping, quite simply, um, they'll be less motivated to participate in their intervention, they'll be less motivated per to participate in school, so they'll have lots of problem behavior and they won't be learning, and a lot of resources we're throwing at them that cost a lot of money are basically being wasted because of this biological setting event, they're too tired. So arguably it's cost effective to solve sleep problems, right? you'll make better use of your resources during the daytime. What are some of the impacts on the family? Open to you. Marital stress. Already stressful situations can be even more stressful if they're not sleeping, right? What else? I was up all night with my kid and I have to go to work, right? Family depends on my income, the other spouse doesn't work, has to stay home with the child, right? Even more stress. And now I'm not performing at work. And what if I lose my job, right? And it just compounds and compounds. So it doesn't take you know, a lot of imagination to see that there's this, uh, this compound effect. Now, the, these are two videos I like to, to show, both put on YouTube by parents. And the first one isn't about solutions. It's basically just to cry for help, like how stressful. Uh, I look, at, look at how stressed I am. And the other is the dad who's kind of come up with his own solution, and we'll talk about that. But first of all, look at this video. I apologize on this screen. It's dark, but it's not really that important to see the kid crying on the couch. Listen to the music. Sam's lying on the couch here.
what does that clip convey to you? A desperate parent, a desperate parent like, totally stressed, right? And she just put this on YouTube, like, ugh, you can just see the emotion, right? And these are the moms and dads that uh, we're working with. So I always show that to my classes when I talk about sleep, just to put it in context. I mean, this is the situation you're going into. This is how bad it is, and this is why we need to help. Now, on the other end of the, of the spectrum, here's a dad who uh, kind of dealt with the same thing, but came up with his own solution. And I'll show you the first minute, 45 seconds, and then I'll show you a picture of what he's talking about. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm glad you found us. If you're on the site or uh, watching this video, you probably have a, a child that you're concerned about their safety throughout the entire night. And if you do, um, you're just like my wife and I were three years ago with Noah. Uh, Noah was diagnosed with autism, and Noah's nonverbal, and he likes to stay up at night, and he'll run around the house if you let him. So once Noah could climb out of the crib, there was no turning back. Uh, he was up running the house every night, and one of us had to be up with him throughout the whole night, making sure that he was safe. And if you're going through this, you know how taxing that can be. Uh, trying to go to work when you haven't had a good night's sleep uh, is awful. You're, you're not as productive, um, you're not as happy, and you're definitely not yourself anymore. And you're going through this for months, even years at a time, um, this can really affect and change your life for the worse and certainly doesn't help with your child either. Um, so the solution that we came up with literally changed our lives, changed Noah's life. Um, with him being in the bed and safe at night, we can actually sleep and gets us back into some sense of normalcy in our life. And that's something that, you know, if your child has special needs, you're striving for. We certainly understand that. We were searching the internet all over, trying to find something, anything that would help us. And unfortunately, at the time, there was nothing on the market. There was nothing out there that would help Noah be safe throughout the night. Uh, so this dad's looking for a product, right? And this is what he built. You see that? Basically a canopy that goes all the way around the bed and over the roof and you zip it shut from the outside. So you can put him in there and zip it shut and he can't get out. Which means you can go to sleep, you don't have to worry about him wandering around the house. That's awesome, isn't it? What can go possibly go wrong? <laughs> can you think of anything? It's an emergency. What if there's a fire, right? He's trapped in his bed, he can't get out. That's a problem. The, you know, I don't know if the, the fire marshal would approve of this. <laughs> What, what about the longevity of this strategy? He's going to figure it out. Are you going to be here forever? Or is he, are you going to have a bigger bed and a bigger bed with more elaborate locks so that he can't get, get out? But look, he's sleeping in his special bed. So you, know, you can understand the, the motive behind developing this for the family, right? It was a lifesaver in the moment. Um, but this also, to me, just illustrates the lengths that people will go to. And it's, but it's not a long-term solution, right? And it's fraught with all sorts of uh, pitfalls. So. Types of problem in uh, types of sleep problems in ASD: prolonged uh, onset of sleep, latency issue. You put the kid down at eight o'clock at night, and she lies there until ten thirty at night, stimming away, talking to herself, looking at the ceiling, but not sleeping. Right? That's not necessarily a problem if she lies there happily, but she hasn't learned to lie down and fall asleep, and this might uh, degrade in the future. Later bedtime, you know, f a kid in kindergarten, five six year old, she'll probably be going to bed around eight or nine o'clock at night. Eight o'clock at night. And we know lots of five-year-olds who go to bed at 11 o'clock or midnight, and they still have to get up for school, right? So they are fatigued, and going to bed earlier would be a good thing. Uh, decreased sleep duration and continuity. This is uh, what we saw with Sam and what his mother, mother was reporting, where he kind of goes to bed, then he's up, and he's restless, and he's crying, and he's moving around, and he's back to sleep, right? That's how I was last night, so that I would get up on time to be here. Increased arousal and awakening. This is the kid who wakes up at 2.37 and says, Pancakes and Lion King, anybody? Right? <laughs> Let's party. And then after Lion King, let's go back to bed, right? But now you can't go back to bed. Uh, early morning wakings, I had a really good friend who had a son, Dante. And from the time Dante was really little, clockwork, he got up at 5 a.m., right? We would go camping. We would be up late. Dante would be up till midnight, and he'd be up at 5 a.m. None of us wanted to be up at 5 a.m., but when Dante gets up, we got to get up, right? And this went on forever and ever, and his parents took him to see pediatrician, and they just kind of threw up their hands and said, this is Dante. This is Dante's nervous system. He gets up at five. I don't know why, 
but no matter what they did, playing with naps, going to bed earlier or later, he just woke up at five. And we know some of those kids, right? Who they just get up. And the fact that they're getting up so early can be a bit of a challenge. You've got bedwetting and grinding your teeth at night. We're not going to be dealing with those today. You know, probably you'll see the dentist for a night guard. These are more on the medical end. This is the things that uh, the sleep sig of IMFAR really looks at. It's nocturnal seizures, you know, epilepsy, parasomnias, which are night terrors, and sleepwalking, and the apnea waking you up, and uh, daytime sleepiness. And for these things in particular, you can go to BC Children's and you can get a sleep study, technically, technically called a polysomnography is a fun word to say, but you can get sleep studies. Um, and I've had a few kids who go, but, and it turns out they have apnea, and the medical um, side of things treats the apnea. And what the behavioral side of things will often do is, uh, my job is to teach him to tolerate this before he has to go in and do the sleep study, because if he can't wear this, we can't do the sleep study, right? So sometimes that happens, we've got local resources to deal with that. Some of the causes of poor sleep, remember if you need a normal nervous system to get a normal sleep, a lot of these things are messing with your normal nervous system, right? If you've got biological neurotransmitter um, abnormalities, neurological epilepsy, kids who are anxious. Uh, honestly, in my practice, I've never had to deal with anxiety as a bedtime issue, but we know that it's out there, right? We know that there are young um, boys and girls with autism who are very anxious and very high functioning. We used to call them Asperger's. And they might not go to bed because they're worried about their marks or they're worried about school or they're worried about a bully at school, right? And that anxiety is impacting their sleep. Uh, medications mess with your normal nervous system, right? And some of our kids are taking all sorts of other meds for all sorts of other things, and that's going to have an impact on their sleep. That's all the medical side of things. That's not what we're here to talk about today. We're going to focus on the last thing, which is uh, the behavioral piece, obviously. And the medical doctors have a silly term for this. They call it sleep hygiene. First time I heard that, hygiene is like, you know, using deodorant and being clean. That's not, but what they're talking about is like having a good schedule and getting ready for bed and having a comfortable room. So if you hear sleep hygiene, that's what they're talking about. Again, what I like to stress to, to my students when I'm talking about sleep is that autism is a spectrum. This isn't a universal thing, right? If you look at the previous prevalence statistics we looked at, some kids, they won't have any issues. They're perfect sleepers. And they're, you, you, want, you want to take the opportunity to celebrate that with their family. And so you should be really happy that your kid sleeps through the night. No, we're working on other things, but that's a win for you. It's good that we don't have to deal with this. So let's deal with uh, our behavioral assessment. So as good behavior analysts, we always start with uh, some baseline data. Because this is nighttime, uh, you're probably not going to be there, right? You're going to need to train the, the moms and dads to take this data. So this data should inform you regarding uh, what's occurring in terms of sleep. Right? When are they going to bed? What are their habits? When's the kid waking up? Right? What's the sleep cycle? And then what's happening in and around that behaviorally? Now remember that your interviewee is a sleep-deprived parent. And they're not going to suffer fools gladly. Right? So you don't kind of, I would discourage you to kind of wing your questions. Like, so tell me about sleep. What's it like? It's bad. Well, what's bad about it? He's not sleeping. Like, ask me a smart question, right? They don't have time for our silly questions. And the same thing applies if you're doing functional assessment. And we always start with a clinical interview, right? Functional assessment interview or other. A functional, a structured interview basically is just a, it helps guide you to be asking these good questions, right? You, you, hopefully it prevents us from asking dumbass questions. So we start with a structured interview. And again, you can get a structured interview in Sleep Better. And if you Google it, you'll find increasing resources. Uh, Autism Society, I believe, has uh, some good stuff. And they cite Dr. Mallow and their references. So here are some uh, questions from a structured interview. First of all, does he have a regular bedtime and waking time? And it might turn out that, uh, well, last night he went to bed at 8, and it was great. But the night before that, he went to bed at 10. Uh, and two weeks ago, he stayed up till 3. And what it turns out is you ask these questions is, no, no, he doesn't. It's not like we have a regular routine, we have a bath and brush your teeth and we're in bed at 8. It changes every single day. That's important to know when it comes to the intervention, right? Because a lot of our intervention is going to be around teaching them to go to bed. So we need to know this. And waking time. You know, if the kid has a bad sleep, and this is the parent who decides, well, I'm going to let him sleep in, and we'll take them late to school. So we might show up to school at 9. We might be there at 10. Sometimes we take the morning off to sleep. Right? And this is just perpetuating things. Just If you or I, often, if we get a bad sleep, we still have to get up and go to work. Right? We don't get to sleep in. And then that just further disrupts things. Is the bedtime routine, is the sleep hygiene the same each evening? Like, do you have that good bedtime routine? I bet you most of you have a good bedtime routine. You do the, the same things in pretty much the same order, and that helps you know, de-stress you and get you ready for sleep at the end of the day, right? That's important for our kids as well. It's important for everybody. Um, do they play in bed? 
is this a place that's the stimulus control is conditioned for sleep or for roughhousing and playing and flipping me and tickling me because this is it's hard to go to sleep when we're having that much fun, right? So that should be a place associated with sleep. Does he sleep better away from his bed than in it? Right? When we're in a hotel room, no problem. He's out like a light, sleeps perfectly. Well, what is it about the hotel room that's different from the bedroom? Is it a lighting issue? Is it a comfort issue? Is it a noise issue? Right? Maybe he sleeps at grandma's house, but not at mom and dad's house. Now, let's analyze what's going on there so that we can hopefully you know, program some common stimuli and, and have that happening at home. Does he have any caffeine? It might seem like a silly question. Parents thinking this is one of your dumbass questions. No, we don't give him coffee. Oh, but he does eat three chocolate bars at six o'clock at night. Okay, well, there's caffeine in the chocolate bars. Too much caffeine in chocolate is going to be a problem. Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper, right? <laughs> right before bed. Does he engage in vig vigorous activity? One of the things that uh, you learn from Mark Duran, the sleep uh, research in general, is that there is a, uh, a sweet spot. There's a window. If you do vigorous exercise four to six hours before bed, it tends to be conducive to then later falling asleep. If you do it much earlier, 10 hours before sleep, it has no impact on your sleep. If you do vigorous exercise too close to bedtime, well then you're all revved up and it's not gonna be conducive to sleep. So you wanna make sure you're not doing the vigorous stuff right before bed. Does he resist going to bed? He fights it, you know, what does that look like? What is he saying? You can ask some follow-up questions here. Does he take more than half an hour to fall asleep? This is looking at uh, latency issues, right? That late onset of sleep. Does he awaken during the night but remain quietly in bed? Because some kids do this, and even if they're in bed, doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for mom and dad because they're still awake, like listening. Oh, he's just quietly talking in bed, but I'm still up making sure that he's just quietly talking in bed. And he's still not sleeping, right? So it's still a problem. Does he get up in the night and engage in problem behavior? We want to know that because that's one of the main categories of sleep problems is being up in the night, disruptive night waking. Are there naps? Most of the kids I work with, their naps finished years ago, but it, don't assume, right? Sometimes you would assume, no, I, no, I would bet my paycheck the kid's not napping, but it turns out that he is. And that's important because that's going to affect the motivating operation for sleep at the end of the day, right? Are they taking any drugs? Sometimes the parents are starting things that you're, you might not be aware of, and it's having an impact on sleep, so you should be aware of it. Does he go to bed too early, wake up too early, is it a timing issue? Does he awaken in the night upset? You know, are we getting into nightmares and sleep terrors and things like that? Um, if so, can he let, be calmed, right? That's a nightmare. Does he scream loudly, not fully awaken? Now we're getting to night terrors, right? And here's where I would tend to go to the pediatrician. I've never had to deal with that, curiously. Um, does he experience daytime narcolepsy, falling asleep? I've never dealt with that. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, does the person snore? Go to BC Children's, uh, investigate the apnea. Uh, are the blankets in disarray? Restless, restless leg syndrome, disrupting sleep. Uh, does he wet the bed? Um, under age five, it's, it's not ab that abnormal, right? But if you know you're 10 and wetting the bed, that's a big issue. After five, it's a problem. Grinding teeth, maybe we need to see the, the dentist. Um, is it an anxiety issue, right? And the parents can inform you of that. Are they worried about tomorrow? Does the person um, have problem behaviors at other times? Is this just uh, more occasions from problems that are happening at other times of the day? We need to look at a bigger picture. It's not just a bedtime issue. And when did the primary sleep problem start? Quite often it'll be some trigger event. Like the kids slept normally, it hasn't been an issue, but then we went to France for July, and ever since we came back, oh my goodness, we need help, right? Aha, that violation of sameness, you, you know, disrupted it majorly, and that was the, the impetus. So these are some of the questions that come up in a sleep interview. Right? Now, more kind of traditional data from our perspective, you've got a sleep diary and a behavior log. So the sleep diary is basically, and there's a sleep diary in the appendix of the Duran book, is basically trying to give you an insight into the sleep-wake cycle. When is the kid going to bed, waking during the night, waking in the morning? Um, because anecdotally, this is difficult to get because it's detailed information over multiple days. So you actually want it logged. And do it nightly, not retrospectively. The other thing I'll do is if I'm really working with a family to do this, I'll go to my way to check in the first morning. How was it last night? Did you take your data? Could you email it to me? Give me an opportunity to reinforce you and praise you for doing it. And the next day and the next day until I can tell you they've, they've got it, right? As opposed to just leaving this with them. Because we are leaving it with them. It's bedtime. We're not there. So here's what uh, the sleep cycle diary will look like. So on Sunday, put you to bed at 10 o'clock, fell asleep at 10.30, woke up at 2.37 in the morning, right? walked around the house, mom put back to bed, 
woke him up at 9 o'clock to go to school, right? You'd write that type of thing down. Was there any nap, yes or no? And what I'm really interested to see in particular is when did you go to sleep, how long, and um, are you waking during the night? Because this gets into stimulus control issues between bedtime and middle of the night that I'll talk about later that are really the critical thing. Behavior log, um, what's happening during? So at 9 o'clock, asleep within 5 minutes. Um, how did that happen? Well, I lay down with him, out like a light. Partially good. But then at 12.37, he woke up, he was singing in bed. So I went back and lay with him until he fell asleep. Right? Later on, 3.57, singing in bed. I went back to room, lay down with him until he fell asleep and slept there the rest of the night. And if this is happening night after night after night, I have an insight into what the problem is and how I want to solve it. Right? In particular, this kid needs to learn to go to bed uh, by himself in order to stay asleep by himself throughout the night. Okay? Any questions about that? That's about as complicated as it gets when it comes to the data. And that's as complicated as we want it to be because we're leaving it with the moms and dads to do. There, there isn't an interventionist there, hardly ever. I'll give you an example later where I had to send somebody in because it wasn't, wouldn't happen otherwise, but mostly this is up to moms and dads. All right, so interventions. The first thing to set the stage for intervention is to talk about what the medical community calls the sleep hygiene and we would just call our pre-bedtime routine. And the starting place is having a good routine, having a routine. So in some fields, it's sleep hygiene. So we know kids thrive on structure, so let's give them the structure so they've got this predictability, right? And there's that characteristic of autism. I like the predictability. Let's make, let's make bedtime a predictable routine. Some families have no problem with this. Others, they need some help. So have a set bedtime routine, develop uh, sleep and wake times, right? And if in your interview, you know it's all over the map, you might want to talk with mom and dad and arrive at a consensus, right? And this is not something we ever dictate because we have no control over it. This has to be a true consensus. And I'll tell the parent, if you disagree with my opinion, tell me, because that's fine, right? I'm not here to convince you to do it my way. Let me help you in your house. So when would you like him to go to bed? And when do you need him to get up? And maybe this needs some tweaking. We need to formalize this plan. And then once we commit to it, let's uh, also try and keep it constant through the weekend. Did any of you try and get up at the same time on the weekend? It makes Monday morning easier. Some of you nod. Some of you say, heck no, I'm going to sleep in and take advantage, right? For our kids, we want, that we want it to be consistent, if at all possible. No caffeine, some parents need to be told this, i.e. sugar and uh, chocolate. Uh, you know, no booze. Hopefully they haven't been giving good scotch to the kid before bed, but you know, my grandma used to say, what's wrong with the little bum? Um, <laughs> that explains my mother, yeah. So try drinking warm milk, right? It does have the amino acid L-tryptophan. It can be conducive to sleep. A balanced diet, um, you know, you don't want to go to bed hungry, but you don't want to go to bed with greasy food. Greasy fatty foods are not conducive to a good sleep, as some of you might know. Um, no exercise in the hours before bed. There's that, um, that sweet spot window that I talked about. Four to six hours prior is when you want to get in the exercise. But after that, don't do anything vigorous beforehand. That's just going to be counterproductive. Resist um, playing in bed like it's a play structure. And they love selling beds like this. And as a parent, you go, wow, that's awesome. I'd love to have that. But really, no. What message does this send, right? This is a playground. No, your bed should be fairly boring, right? Because all you're supposed to do there is lie down and fall asleep with short latency. That's all we want you to be doing, right? Once you get older, you can do other things. But um, reduce the noise, reduce the lighting. You need, I'll often go into the room and look at this with the mom and dad. Like, tell me exactly what you do. And I want to go down to the detail. Like, is there a night light on? Where's the night light? What's the path of the light? And do you leave it on or do you shut it off after they're, they're asleep? That's going to be a critical stimulus control issue, as I'll get to later on. Um, temperature extremes. You've probably had this experience when you go into a new hotel room, you're going to be there for a few days, right? And you have to find that sweet spot on the temperature control so that you're not too hot, not too cold, and after the first night of having a bad sleep, you figure it out, and then you're good for the rest of your stay, right? So here's the punchline. And I stress this to parents. Ensure the conditions under which you fall asleep remain consistent through the rest of the night. If the kid goes to bed with mom, mom probably has to stay there all night long or there will be waking during the night, more often than not. If the light's on, leave the light on. If the TV's on, leave the TV on. All of these little innocuous things, don't mess with them. After the kid falls asleep, these are the conditions under which they put themselves to sleep. So later on, they need to remain constant. And I'll talk about that in the context of the sleep cycle in a moment, okay? Do's and don'ts, have a de-stressing, calming routine, a bath time, right? Don't know, you know, punk rock music, let's make it nice and 
Zen, keep the order of things consistent. Uh, don't choose things that are gonna be a conflict, right? If they're old enough and this is an issue, like homework, did you finish your homework? I didn't finish my homework. This is not the time for that. You deal with that in the morning or earlier. And basically any of these eye devices, you'll hear this on the radio. A study says people who have screen time before bed don't sleep as well, right? For the general population. So we follow that. Um, avoid extending the bedtime, getting sucked into like one more story, and now you've lost control of the circumstance. But also recognize that we need to customize this. I've got one little girl I work with, and I'll use her as an example coming up, and her mom has done a lot of work around her sleep, and mom's been very successful, and we pat her on the back all the time. Um, for that girl, she has iPad as part of her sleep routine. And it's a really effective part of her sleep routine. She has it, and she goes to bed, no problem. If we took it away, it would cause a problem at bedtime, right? So that's an exception to the, the device rule. So, General guidelines, but there will be exceptions. And we have to have the flexibility ourselves to be okay with those exceptions. A word of caution on the routine. Uh, it can go too far into rigidity, right? So one little girl I worked with, oh, sorry, it was Fred, it was a boy. Uh, before going to bed every night, he had all these stuffies, and I think it, originally it was like one stuffy, but then it became two, and then it became 20. And he would organize all of the stuffies on his bed and then he'd get in and it had to like stay just the right way and the universe was in order and he could fall asleep. But what happens in the night is the stuffies fall off the bed and he'd be screaming in the middle of the night because a stuffy fell off the bed. And mom comes running in and ah, 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 not really using words to communicate until she figured, oh, I have to get the stuffies back and order them. And then you go back to sleep. And it happened a couple hours later, right? And so the solution there was essentially they got a, an Ikea doll bed and he was taught, you can order any stuffies you want, but they have to be on the Ikea bed beside your bed. And he, we just transferred the ritual down here, and then it didn't disrupt things during the night. And the new rule was you can take one stuffie to bed. And mom, stick to your guns, right? Don't let it become two and then 20 again, right? So that's an anecdote. So here's two types of problems. When it comes to BCBAs, BCABAs, solving bedtime problems, these are our two categories. And one usually leads to two, right? Going to bed problems usually leads to night waking problems, although night waking problems can occur on their own. And where you want to start is fix going to bed, and I'll tell you why in a little while. So I'll talk to you about some strategies for going to bed. Again, for context, and I always take the opportunity with my students to stress the family perspective, right? When, when you go to bed, you just want to go to bed, right? You don't want to do a procedure. You don't want to do any work. And these families are no different, right? They've had their stressful day. They come home. They just want to go to bed. But no, there has to be the bedtime battle, right? And it is stressful. And if we're coming in there with an intervention at the stressful time, they, we're giving them work to do. So we want to be really sensitive to that. The Berenstein Bears even wrote a book about the bedtime battle. So just be sensitive to the fact that this is not when people want to be doing procedures, so we need to coach them through it and make it as doable as possible and let them know, I want to help you do this, but most of the time it is up to you, and if you're not comfortable, we can wait, right? So here are some examples of going to bed. These are real examples that I've worked with. Um, Avery will only fall asleep if daddy, and only daddy, rocks her in his arms with her head on his left arm, sitting on the bottom right side of mom and dad's bed and he has to rock her. And if you were to try and move to the other quadrant of the bed, uh-uh, problem behavior, back to this quadrant of the bed, and not the other side of the bed. And this was going on and on, and parents don't think anything of it, as long as they get her to sleep, right? And then I was there for a meeting one night, and I saw her being put to bed, and I watched, and I said, what's going on? And what do you mean, what's going on? Well, why does he need to do that? Well, that's how we get her to bed. Is that how you want to get her to bed? No, but that's how she's taught us to put her to bed, right? Mom was very humble about that. She's conditioned us. So this was a problem. And the other problem was dad leaves town from time to time. He's not there. You don't want to be in the house on those days, right? Because that's a miserable, miserable cry myself to sleep night because daddy's not there to rock me to bed. So very, very rigid. So we need to fix that. Sarah will only fall asleep if mom is in the room and she can touch some um, part of mom's skin. Right? A clothed elbow is not okay, but a naked elbow is fine. Right? A naked hand is okay, but don't put a glove on. There has to be skin-to-skin -skin contact. So mom is like lying there, being touched, or we'll just lie down beside her because mom just wants to rest too, and then she's got her hands all over mom, and this is how she falls asleep. But this isn't the conditions under which she falls asleep don't stay constant through the night, right? Mom will get up and go back to her own bed. And so it's not a surprise that Sarah also gets up in the middle of the night and goes to mom and dad's bed, puts her hands back on mom's bare skin, and then falls asleep right away. So we need to fix that. 
Emily, I told you about at the beginning, only falls asleep on the couch watching Peter Mansbridge on CTV News, right? Something about his voice and all that other stimulus control. So we needed to transfer the control from this condition to the bed, from this condition to alone in bed, right? From this condition to alone in bed is really the holy grail we're shooting for. So there are two big strategies you can work with here. The first one is graduated extinction. You guys familiar with Ferber? The Ferber method? Not Furby the toy, but Ferber, right? He must have been a doctor in the 70s or 80s, and my parents' generation were taught. The Ferber method is you teach your kid to self-soothe. So this is very similar to that. So you teach the kid to fall asleep on their own, to self-soothe. Um, it's easy to fall into the trap, right? Because especially if you've been nursing a child and you're used to them falling asleep with you, and then after you stop nursing, that just continues and it perpetuates itself, right? In the meantime, we're conditioning this really powerful stimulus control that we need to, to be fixing. So graduated extinction, you pick a bedtime, you're firm about the schedule, and then you put the kid down, you kiss them goodnight, and you leave, and if they cry, you wait. And you have an interval that you've picked in, in advance, hopefully with uh, some of the baseline data from your sleep diary. So if we're waiting five minutes, I stand outside, and then I go in, but I don't go in and touch and pick up and give contact. I just go in and give a quick reassurance. I'm still here, you're going to bed, you're fine, love you, Good night. Set the watch, wait to the next interval, and then you go in, right, and you do this again, and you basically repeat and repeat until the kid eventually falls asleep. And you're allowed these check-ins, right? So that you're not damaging their psyche in the long term, according to Ferber anyway. Um, pick a night to start. Typically, you don't want to do this like on a Tuesday when you've got an important work presentation the next day. Pick a long weekend so that you can ride this out because it might take a little while. If they're still crying, you go back again, again as I said. On subsequent nights, you wait longer before you do your check-in, and you wait longer before you do your check-in. And you continue the same procedure when you're in. You never go in and pick up and touch. Right? It's just a reassurance and then out, okay? Foolproof, right? Not necessarily. There's a lot of ifs here. So this can work if the kid will stay in bed. And it's the rare, you know, extremely compliant kid who'll just lie there and, but be upset and not go to sleep. It will work if mom and dad can tolerate the crying. And the number one reason that I don't use this is the mom will say, oh, I can't do that. I, I'll go in, Richard. Thank you for telling me that. Well, then we won't do this, right? Because, or she'll lie. Yeah, I've been doing it. No, she hasn't, right? And things are perpetuating. This is the number one killer of the strategy. The parents just say, no way. Uh-uh, I can't do it. It kills me. It tears me apart. Thank you for being honest. We won't do this, right? I won't suggest this. The other is, um, if you've got... If you're sharing a bedroom, if there's another kid in the house, if you're in an apartment or condo and there's neighbors who won't tolerate it, that's another environmental barrier that you can't do this, right? So there's a lot of reasons why you can't. Um, and typically, as Noah's dad said on that second video, as soon as you can get out of the crib, you've lost your basically confined section, right? As soon as the kid can walk and get out of bed, they can violate this. So it's limited, but it is an evidence-based practice. There's research that shows that this can be effective if, 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 right? So it can work well for some parents if all those ifs can be satisfied. However, most of the time they can't tolerate the crying. So another strategy, and that's what I talked about with Emily uh, in my intro, is the bedtime fading alternative. And this procedure keeps them up later, right? And increases the, the motivation to fall asleep because they're literally dead on their feet. You're doing everything possible to keep them up, right? And they just want to, well, they just want to sleep. So you select the bedtime when your child is likely to fall asleep with little difficulty within 15 minutes. One of the things you want to strive for in a sleep intervention is to teach the kid not only to fall asleep alone, but to fall asleep fast. So you set a maximum allowable, allowable latency, right, 15 minutes. And that's actually a long time. I typically see it in 5 to 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to keep you awake later. So if the um, default bedtime is 1 a.m., well, then I'm going to keep you up to 1.30. Or if I want to be really conservative, I'm going to keep you up till 2.00 so that you are just literally on the verge of passing out. You're so fatigued. And then I put you to bed, right? And you want mom or dad, not a therapist, to do this so that it's a natural stimulus control and kiss you goodnight and boom, you're out. That's the ideal. And it can happen that quickly. And sometimes it does happen that quickly if we contrive the motivation sufficiently, right? And so we do this until there's no resistance for a couple nights and then you fade back. That's why it's called bedtime fading. And I described with Emily at the beginning that, you know, the first night, we were up till three o'clock in the morning. But after several weeks, and I was only there for the first two weeks, and then I removed myself, and then dad continued it, because I'd been there to coach him, and he was doing a really good job of implementation. They got all the way back in 15 minute intervals over the course of several weeks to a month. 
to, to 9.30. And she would go to bed at 9.30 instead of at 11 o'clock when Peter Mansbridge came on, right? So that's what you do here. Um, it's a lot of work. And when they're awake, you, like I said earlier, it's boring. There's nothing to do. You can't have the TV on for yourself. You're literally sitting there in the dark trying to keep them awake and not entertained so that they want to go to bed. Right? And I've seen some kids doing this where they'll say, can I please go to bed now? Right? And then it's your call because maybe that's genuine and if I acknowledge that request and I put you down, you will pass out. Or maybe that actually, no, you'll just jump up again. I have to keep you up longer, right? So you have to be careful there. There's a potential pitfall. So if not asleep within 15 minutes, this is the bedtime with response cost. I don't want to teach you to lie here and be awake. So if you are still awake after 15 minutes or at any point between kiss goodnight and the 15 minutes you've gotten up, then we go back downstairs and we stay awake in the dark, boring living room for another half hour or an hour, right? And that's why it was three o'clock in the morning before we got Emily to sleep the first night. It's a lot of work. So looking at these two, graduated extinction involves letting the kid get upset and then waiting longer times before you check in on them, right? And so they learn to self-soothe and calm themselves and go to sleep. Bedtime fading, you keep them up much later. Um, usually there's less problem behavior because they're so bloody tired. Right? That they're not going to cry and cry and cry. They just want to go to sleep if we've really um, managed the antecedents adequately. And both have supporting research. Right? Both of these things have studies that show that they, they can work. But it's not a one-size-fits-all. So as clinicians, we, you know, we load the buffet. Say, well, we could do this, we could do a bit this, we could do a bit of a combination. What are you comfortable with, mom or dad? Because you're going to be the one to do it. And feel free to shoot down any of my ideas. I've got nothing, you know, no ego wrapped up in this. And if you can't do this right now, tell me that. What will often happen, I think I have a cue to say this later, but what I've often had happen is a parent will come to me with a sleep problem and I'll look at what's happening and we'll arrive at probably one of these two solutions, more often than not faded, uh, bedtime fading, and I'll describe it to them and I will pull no punches. Right? This is hard, I'm not there to do it. I'll check in in the morning, I'm your you know, moral support, but you're gonna have to do it. More often than not, the parent will go, yeah, maybe not now, that's fine because right? we can't dictate this. You tell me when you want help, and then I'll leave, and I'll wait. And two or three months later, their MO is now so powerful because they still haven't been sleeping, they come back. You know that sleep thing we talked about? I think I'm ready. Are you sure? Remember what it was like? I'm almost like talking them out of it. No, no, really, I'm ready. Look at me. Right? Okay, right? And then we'll do it. And so I, I just share that as, a, as an anecdote. That's been my experience. And the first time, more often than not, they'll say no thanks but they'll come back to it, right? It would be different if we sent in people to do it for them, right? Then we'll bring it on, let's do it tonight. The pros of graduated extinction, crying it out, is you get to go to bed at a regular bedtime. You don't have to stay up late and be that disruptive. You get to check in, and the research shows that it's actually usually effective within a week, this extinction procedure with check-ins, if you can do it. Right? If, 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 all the, if you satisfy all those ifs. You have to be able to listen to the crying. Um, it could get worse, right? While the kid's lying there, you know, what's the problem behavior? What are you reinforcing? Maybe they're crying, but now they're you know, painting the walls with poop or breaking the window or, God forbid, self-injurious behavior. And so there's a limit to where this will um, fall apart and you can't do it, right? The faded bedtime where you keep them up, it, it's often seen as errorless because there's no increase in problem behavior if we do it well because they're just so tired. They learn to fall asleep really rapidly without any protest. And so the trade-off is you don't have to listen to your kid crying, but you have to stay up later and do this protocol that's arguably more effortful. I think it's more effortful. The con is someone's got to do it, right? And it can take weeks because you probably have a late night like Emily did, that 3 o'clock the first night, and then it takes weeks. You know, every two nights of success, bring it back by 15 minutes. Bring it back, bring it back. And you might get tempted, let's bring it back by 45 minutes. And then it blows up and you have to go back to where you were, right? So you have to be conservative. If you jump ahead, you take a risk. It might pay off, but it is a risk. And I just underline again, it's effortful. This is really, really hard work. And more often than not, we're not there to help. We can't tell them, so this is, uh, I spoke prematurely, there's my cue, where I give it to them and then I wait. Um, but sometimes they'll come back, I, so one mom in particular that I've worked with, and she is a single parent who has a child who is quite impacted by his autism. Uh, bedtime is a, a nightmare for them. It, it, she, he has to lie in her bed, but he doesn't lie there cooperatively. He pulls her hair and hits her and pinches her, and it's just a bad situation, and she looks like she's abused, and it's just from this tiny little kid beating her up in bed before he falls asleep. So he needs to go to bed in his own room. And um, every six months, we would have this conversation. And I'd tell her the strategies. And she'd be, yeah, no, I don't think I can. 
And it, but it got to the point that it was so bad last June at this IEP meeting for the kids. She comes into the IEP meeting and we're all like, whoa, look at mom. She looks like death. And it was the sleep issue had become critical. So we, um, she's very clever in uh, organizing her respite funding. We found an ABA student who was going to go in on a, um, a temporary no commitment contract. Basically, you're going to go in every night, night at 9 o'clock and help mom put the kid to bed. We don't know how long you'll have to be there. We don't know how many days you're going to have to commit to this. Want to sign up? And, <laughs> and we found somebody who said, yes, thank goodness. And so in this case, the, the strategies that I knew needed to be done two years ago, and every six months we talk about it, and she would say no. That's exactly what we did two years later. But what happened was um, this kid we knew from his um, baseline data that if mom was home, he would insist on being in her bed and beat her up and fall asleep. If a, a, a caregiver, a respite person was at home and mom was out, the respite person could put him in his own bed, shut the door, and leave, and he would sleep all night. So there's this huge disconnect, right? So we know it's possible. So we didn't do bedtime fading with him. What we did was we got the, the BI to show up, essentially, and do the bedtime routine. And so we had a meeting beforehand. What's he going to do? He's going to brush his teeth with him and do this. You're already going to have him bathed and changed. The BI shows up and says goodbye to you, and you go out the door and shut the door and then wait on the stoop. And as long, the kid thinks you're gone. And then the BI would put him to bed. No problem. So we did this for two nights because this strange guy shows up to put me to bed. Kind of weird. <laughs> um, so the kid's like lying there confused. Okay. Uh, and then the next night, mom went and stood downstairs. And so the kid knew she didn't leave. She's still in the house. But Max put him to bed again. And he cooperated. But he tried to pull down the drapes. And so we had to do some problem solving about getting rid of anything he can be destructive with. And the next night, when all those things were taken away, Max got him to bed. And he knew that mom was still downstairs. And then the next night, mom was halfway up the stairs, and then mom was on the landing, and then mom was Velcroed shoulder to shoulder with Max, doing it together. <laughs> and, then and then we reversed it, and then Max was waiting at the door, and Max was waiting on the stoop, and Max was waiting downstairs. And it's, he was like the bouncer here, right? Like, <laughs> not that he's a big guy, but he was the enforcer. Like, was, the kid knew as long as Max was in the house, I'm going to go to bed by myself. And it got to the point, the final leap of faith was, Max came in, said, hi, bye shut the door, and then mom put him to bed, and he went to bed without a problem. And mom couldn't believe it, right? And it, this was in less than two weeks that they accomplished this whole thing. We weren't really clear on what the timeline would be, but we had a, a rough task analysis, and we emailed every morning. What next? Oh, that worked? Great, let's go to the next thing. And we solved it, but she needed somebody to go in and do it for her and transfer that stimulus control, because she'd shown that she couldn't do it. And she also has a history of, when other people came in to toilet train her kid, he got toilet trained. When other people came in to do the feeding, he started eating food at the table and putting his dish away when he was done. So you know, I, I learned that a lesson from this, that you know, some of the parents, earlier on, we need to recognize that we do need to give them some in vivo support. Let's, let's you know, be creative and find it. And then it worked. And then they went to Germany for a month. And we're worried, okay, what's going to happen when he comes back? And so they were very proactive. Mom called Max. Max came back the first night. Like, home from the airport. Max is waiting on the door. <laughs> Good and talk. And, and he went to sleep the first night. And Max came back the second night just for mom's moral support. And then mom said, that's no, okay, Max, I got it. And that was um, around August. And he still goes to bed every night with mom. Went, How cool is that? But we needed that implementation support. Here's the bonus. I alluded to this earlier. You know, two types of problems. Kids who can't go to sleep by themselves and the kids who wake up in the night. And these two things go together. The research is pretty definitive. If you solve going to bed, they'll stay asleep the rest of the night. That was the case with Emily. That was the case with, with the Max's client. Right? So what's happening here from a stimulus control perspective is, the like I said earlier, the conditions under which you fall asleep need to stay consistent throughout the night. So what happens when you fall asleep is you go through your sleep cycles, right? You go to light sleep, to deep sleep. And one of the things that I learned from you know, the medical people is when you come up into that shallow sleep, you become partially conscious. This happens to all of us in a regular sleep. But we are in our own rooms and we're comfortable and nothing's you know, changed. And so we become partially conscious several times throughout the night and we just put ourselves back to sleep and we, we don't remember it in the morning that that even happened. That's part of, that's normal sleep. If you go to a hotel, have you ever had the experience where around 2 o'clock in the morning, you kind of, where am I? Oh, yeah, Chicago. <laughs> right? And then you're over that. So it happens to us, right? So here's, here's the issue, is the conditions under which you fall asleep have to stay consistent. So if, I, if mom's lying beside me and I fall asleep, this exerts powerful stimulus control. This is how I fall asleep. And then at some point in the night, when I come into that, that shallow consciousness, that shallow sleep, Mom's gone, I fully wake up. 
screwed with my sleep cycle. And I go and I find mom, and she comes back, or I sleep with her. And this is the problem, this is the baseline problem, right? So I had a mom who um, always slept with mom and dad, kids getting big, mom's getting sick of it. Uh, he would only tolerate um, sleeping in his room if the TV was turned on. He'd stay in bed, I mean, he needed mom with him, but he'd stay in bed if the TV was on. And so they'd turn on the TV, he'd lie there, he'd fall asleep. When mom and dad went to sleep, they'd turn off the TV and go to bed. And then in the night, he'd wake up and come into their bed. What changed? The TV was turned off. So we had a meeting about this, and I said, leave the TV on. No volume, static channels, leave the TV on. What do you care? It's not you know, a green strategy. You're burning some electricity. So she said, that's kind of weird. That can't work. She called me the next day. We left the TV on. He slept all night in his own bed. Great. You, you've identified the stimulus control. You kept it consistent from the conditions under which you fall asleep must remain the same. Now, at some point, he has to learn with, to not sleep with a TV running needlessly in the room, right? But it was that striking. And then when I said earlier about if the night light's on, leave the night light on. If the door's cracked open in the hallway and the hallway light's on, leave the door cracked open, leave the light on. Because that slight change under the conditions, the conditions under which I fell asleep could be enough to fully wake me if they're different when I hit that shallow bit of sleep. So 80% of the time, if, if they're reporting, oh man, I have to sleep with him when he goes to bed, and then the night he comes to my bed, if you fix bedtime, he won't come to your bed anymore because he's learned to fall asleep, and you just have to be very clear that you keep the stimulus control conditions the same. The conditions under which you fall asleep must remain unchanged. That's the punchline. If parents get that, it's the, the golden ticket to solving most of those bedtime problems. And then you have to fade the mom out. So um, Sarah's mom, who fell asleep, with touching mom's skin, right? That was a stimulus control condition. We had to fade mom out of the room. And so we came up with the task analysis of steps. And so the first step was mom wasn't lying down with her anymore. Mom was sitting in bed with her hand available. And the first few nights she's like, mm -hmm, mommy, lie down. Mommy just stuck her guns. No, I'm here, but I'm not lying down. Here's my hand, go ahead, fall asleep. <laughs> Touch the skin. And she'd do that. And then mom would lie on the floor, take off her sock, put it up on the bed. And Sarah would touch her mom's bare foot and fall asleep. Right? The biggest leap of faith was removing the skin-to-skin -skin contact. Now mom said, no, I'll stay here, but you can't touch me. That was the hardest step, and that took a few nights. And then she tolerated it, and then we had a map. Three feet away, halfway to the door, at the door, outside the door. And mom did this every three nights, met the criteria, all by herself, achieved it, and then she's out to the point where she could go and put her down, walk out, and she would stay asleep. And when she did that, she wouldn't get up in the night and come and find mom, because she'd learned to sleep by herself. Okay. Now, she has autism, and she has this insistence on sameness. So at one point, mom decided, I'm going to take a night class. On Tuesdays, I won't be here at bedtime. <laughs> mom didn't last in her night class. She had to be home, because mom still had to be the person putting her down and then leaving. Right? So there were still other issues that needed to be resolved. I throw this in there because uh, people will talk about medication, melatonin in particular. You guys are all familiar with it. You know, if you go to your intro psych textbook where it talks about sleep issues and medications, it will say, like it says for all sleep, aid, sleep aids, use with the doctor's supervision for one to two weeks. And you all know families who've been doing it for years and self-prescribing, right? Um, so this is out there. If you've got kids who have a hard time falling asleep, well, melatonin might be part of your strategy, right? part of your plan to help them get to sleep. If they're waking up in the night, that slow-release melatonin that keeps you asleep might be part of the strategy. Or maybe they've tried that and it doesn't work. But I just throw that in there because it, it's popular. People know about this. People are doing it. It might be part of our plan. And what if they're still getting up in the night? Well, we've got basically variations of the same plan, uh, but now they're harder to do because you want to be sleeping, not implementing a procedure at 2.30 and 4.30, right? So graduated extinction is the kid still gets up at 2.30, but you're not going to go in, and you're not going to let them come in with you. So you just decide how long you can wait, and then you go in, you do the exact same procedure. I'm still here, you're okay, good night, I love you, and step out, and you wait for them to go back to sleep on their own. Basically, what you want to avoid at all costs is that they come into bed with you, or that you lie down with them, because now you're back to baseline, right? So it's the same a variation of the same procedure that we started with. After two to three consecutive nights, increase the interval, and fade away. Uh, using graduated extinction during disruptive night wakings is reactive, right? You're waiting for it to happen. And so you solve the bedtime, and then maybe this still pops up, even though bedtime's good. Something probably missing in that equation. What could we figure out? But if it's still happening, they could do this, but it's reactive. There is a strategy that you could do that's proactive, but it's really not easy to do. Scheduled awakening. 
So this is an errorless approach. So I'm going to use my sleep diary because I'm still taking that data. My sleep diary tells me that pretty much like on clockwork, you wake up at 2.45. Okay, that's when you hit that shallow point of your sleep cycle. So at 2.15, 30 minutes earlier, I'm going to go in and lightly rouse you, but not wake you. And what's happened here in the, not, on the sleep curves is you're not at the shallowest sleep. You're kind of in the middle. And so at this point, I can, if I rouse you, I disrupt the cycle so that you go back down, right? And I prevent the, the, the night waking. That's the the neurology and the theory behind it. Right? And you talk to the medical folks who really know the sleep cycles, right? It's risky. Because what if you do it too early and you wake them up? What if you're too late and they wake up? And now you've just wasted being up at 2.30 in the morning yourself, right? And why did Richard tell me to do this? This is stupid. Right? I'm going to kill him. So it, it, there's research that shows that this can work. I and mean, if it works, it works quick. You might only have to do it once. And basically, you're messing with their sleep cycles, right? You're disturbing them and sending them back down deeper. And so, you know, it, it makes sense. It has that intuitive appeal. There's the research behind it. Uh, guess how many parents jump at the chance to say, yes, that's a great idea. I'll do that, right? It's a massive barrier. No one has ever said, I'll do this, right? And so typically in that case, we'll go back to working on the bedtime and improving that to the best extent possible. And, and more often than not, we don't have to worry about the night wakings. They do go away. Right? My experience has been totally consistent with that 80% or more. But if you're still hitting some problems, there are these options that are there. There's a few more that you can look at here, right? but they're hard to do. Imagine the procedure he told me to do is get up at 2.15, you know, get up at you know, 2.11, and then go to my kid's room and rouse them but not wake them. So when I'm going to bed, I have to set my alarm for 2.11. I'm that's silly, right? How popular is this going to be? I've got to get up at 2.11 and do the procedure. Right? And then there's a high possibility that I could screw it up and it doesn't work. <laughs> so it's in the literature, but I've never done it in the real world. But just so you know that it's there. So comparing these two, the pros for the extinction where you let them, you check in, but you let them stay by themselves, is it often works within a week, according to the literature. If there is night wakings, and this is possible, they don't leave their room and all the other ifs that we talked about, this can work quick if you do it well. The cons is that you have to allow them crying, and so it goes back to what we said in the first place. If there's a, if someone sharing a room, a sibling down the hall, or neighbors, you can't, right? There's these environmental barriers that preclude its implementation. Scheduled awakenings, the pro is it's errorless. You don't have to wait for them to cry. Uh, the research tells us that it can be successful Instantly, often with just one try. The challenge is getting people to be willing to try it, right? Because there's no, you know, there's no max showing up at 2.11 just to do this, right? And you'd have to be awake anyway to let him in. So, so this falls fully on the parent. The other thing about sleep is the gains that you make. And you know, as a behavior analyst, I've learned about toilet training, I've done toilet training, and now I'm like, bring it on. I'm very optimistic that I can toilet train pretty much anybody, especially if they're little, right? Bring it on. Parents are always like, oh, I'm so scared. No, no, we'll do it, right? And they're pumped up by our enthusiasm, and we're successful with it. I feel the exact same way about sleep. Bring on the sleep issue. We will solve this. I'll help you solve it. You'll do the work, and I'll be your coach, right? Um, but the gains are fragile. Remember Emily, right? The nightly news. We were there till 3 o'clock in the morning. Faded it back to 9.30. We did this in the spring. We did not give any forethought to daylight savings time. <laughs> so the conditions under which you fall asleep before daylight savings time was it was dark at 9.30. The day after daylight savings time, it's bright at 9.30. <laughs> Our gains were gone. The good news was they basically had to do a booster session. They knew what to do. They knew that it worked. They had to redo it. And now she had to learn that, um, in addition to everything else, I have to fall asleep when it's light outside, right? Because it's, it's bright at 9.30 in the summertime. So that, that was an example of fragile gains. If the kid gets sick, that messes up their central nervous system, messes up their sleep, and then after they recover, their sleep's kaput again, right? They go on vacation, they go to grandma's house, they sleep in a strange bed, they come back, kaput, right? You've broken uh, everything that you've taught, potentially. I mean, not all the time, but... You know, to be conservative, assume that it is fragile, and then you're prepared to do a booster, right? The good news is you just need to do more of what you did in the first place, right? When, ben, uh, when uh, Max went to Germany, or Max's guy went to Germany, when they came back, they were prepared with the booster. They planned that in advance for the very first night. Let's not get back into any bad habits, right? The first night is a booster, and it worked. 
So that's the good news there. So you just have to be very careful. You know, if we've just worked on sleep for a month and we've solved it, and now the family says, we're going to Disneyland next week, ah! right? Maybe we should have waited till after Disneyland, or but now we'll be prepared to do a booster when you come back from Disneyland, right? So just be prepared to, to deal with that. Putting all of what I've said into uh, context, um, this presentation surely hasn't been exhaustive. exhaustive. There's much more behaviorally that exists in the literature and in Duran's book, for instance. There's a whole lot more going on around sleep uh, medically that I certainly haven't covered and that I'm not qualified to cover that I would refer to qualified medical practitioners to deal with, right? The apnea and things like that. Um, it's a big area, right? There's a lot of different areas of research in sleep, and we just cover a small bit of it, but the pieces that we do, we can do really, really well, right? We have every reason to be optimistic that we can solve the problems that are appropriate for us to address. Uh, I haven't talked about um, naps. Now, I don't work with a lot of really tiny kids anymore who have naps, but you guys have all been there. I've been there in the past, where at some point we have to get rid of the naps, right? And that can be a challenge, right? As a parent myself, you know, giving up my kids' naps. <coughs> You know, it's like it's passing the torch. It's traumatic. Like, and since he's a baby, he's been napping. And now no more napping? Oh, right? So you have to overcome that. Sleep terrors, nightmares. As I said earlier, I've never really had parents report those things to me. Strangely enough, they must be happening. But I haven't heard about it, so I haven't had to deal with it or sleepwalking. And again, if you're looking for resources, here's your one-stop shop. Thank you very much.